We've talked so many weeks about wrath and destruction and hell and devastation. Finally, we get to the end and we talk, get to talk about heaven. And truthfully, I think about heaven way more than I think about the other place. I really do. I don't spend much time thinking about hell because I'm not anticipating going there. So why dwell on that? People sometimes say the darndest things, don't they? I've heard people say things such as, live forever. I don't want to live forever. That would get boring. You ever heard someone say that? Who wants to live forever? Nobody here wants to live forever? Oh, yeah. uh, not here. Well, <laughs> the assumption is it's not here. Living forever is not boring. I want you to banish the thought. Look, maybe living forever with you <laughs> might be unbearably boring. But the good news is you and I are not the central focus of eternal life. It's not our presence or our light which illuminate the eternal riches of eternal life. No, it's God's glory. It's God light. God's light. So dwelling with the infinitely holy God forever, this is the prize. This is what we want. Now think about infinity for a minute. Think about that. What is it? Try to comprehend it. You can't. You can't. You are finite. But God has promised to dwell with you. Now think about that. Meditate on that. That is a life-giving thought. Now, how do I know this isn't some fantasy, some nonsense, that myth? The reason I know this is because Jesus bodily rose from the dead. He's alive. Truly. It's true. It happened. And the book of Revelation now describes this place, heaven, as many call it. It's described as an eternal city, an eternal Eden city. Remember, Adam and Eve were put, were put in the Garden of Eden? But when we get to the end of Revelation, we see Eden has now transformed into a city. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 21 and read verses 1 to 8. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So, after the millennial reign of Christ and the destruction of Satan forever in the lake of fire, the revelation now transitions to the final consummation of God's plan. Now, I've read this portion of scripture hundreds, maybe thousands, perhaps. I don't know who's keeping count. But preaching through this portion here, it just hits different. As I transitioned from chapter 20 to 21 in my study, I was almost literally brought to tears with the beauty of it all. Now, remember the imagery of chapter 20 last week. Earth and sky, heaven and earth flee away from the presence of the great, great white throne and him who's seated on it and the judgments and the books were open and the dead were judged. And all who were not written in the Lamb's book of life, they were thrown alive into the lake of fire. Then, as all the dust settles from that cataclysmic judgment, John now looks, and we transition into 21, he looks and he sees a new heaven and a new earth. Why? Because the first heaven and the first earth have, 
passed away. And it says the sea was no more. Well, what happened in chapter 20? The earth and sky literally fled away. It was gone. John didn't see it anymore. And when the judgment was over, out of that judgment and out of that destruction, that dust that settled, arose a new heaven and a new earth. Now the question is, is this a literal new heaven and earth? Yes and no. <laughs> I know that's a cop-out answer, but it depends on how you define new. Okay, let me illustrate it like this. The new heaven and new earth are new in the same way the resurrected body of Christ was new. We all would confess, if we're Christians, that Jesus rose from the dead bodily. Amen? So when Jesus rose from the dead, it wasn't some cosmic spiritual thing. It was a bodily, physical resurrection. The body that Jesus rose with is an eternal glorified body. But at the same time, the body of Christ was similar enough that he was recognizable. When he appeared to his di 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 diapers. disciples, that's what happens when you have too many kids. When you deal with, when you, how do I recover from that? Um... What am I trying to say? Disciples. I know that, but I forgot my whole point now because I'm embarrassed. Um, well, that he was recognizable. He was recognizable. Yeah. And when he appeared to his disciples, thank you, Alan, um, he was recognizable enough that they, they said, it's the Lord. They knew it was him. And in most instances, they recognized him. There were some times where they, the veil had to be lifted, but for the most part, they knew who, who he was. So the new heaven and new earth is similar to that. It's God's creation, renewed, renovated, resurrected. And it's a beautiful picture of this city coming out of heaven, the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven from God. It says, prepared as a bride. What John's seeing is not a city with buildings and streets and infrastructure. What he's seeing is the church. The church, the people of God, coming down from heaven, prepared like a bride. It's like at a wedding when you see the bride coming down the aisle and the father bringing her and so forth to, to meet the, the husband. This is the picture we're seeing. It's the people of God the, in the aisle way is heaven. <laughs> and, in the, and the bride's walking down the aisle from heaven to meet, to meet the, uh, the groom. So those saints in heaven now that we read about in chapter 6, which I seem to always be referencing every week, who were persecuted and harassed, some killed by the beast, are now walking down the heavenly aisle, sparkly and adorned with jewels and precious stones, and radiantly beautiful like a bride. Like everybody, right, you go to a wedding, unless it's one of those like, I'm not going to say that. You go to a wedding, <laughs> and it's a nice wedding, and everybody stands for the bride, right? Who's been to a wedding before? Okay, good. So you've seen this. Everybody, it's like it goes silent for a minute, and then somebody makes the announcements, the announcement, uh, all stand for the bride or something similar. And everybody gets up, and the bride comes down, and all eyes are on her. And you girls, you grow up, and for the most part, I don't know, I'm not a girl, I'm not you, but I'm guessing you, th you dream of this moment. <laughs> When you're walking down that aisle and everyone's looking at you and you're all dolled up and you're the center of attention and right? Am I am I right? You guys dream about that? Come on, you watch Disney movies growing up? You dream about it. Let's 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 be honest here. Okay. Um, but men, we don't really dream about our, the, our wedding day in that same way. We don't think about. I mean, what, what are we thinking about? Standing in one spot and waiting, right? Like, let's go. Let's get the show on the road. But this is a picture. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. The bride coming to meet the husband. This was prophesied in Isaiah 65. It says this. Uh, where is it? 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever. That's what I'm looking for. In that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. So Isaiah prophesies this, and John is reiterating that prophecy in Revelation here. A loud voice from heaven exclaims, the joy of the union, just like at a, at a, at a human wedding. The bride's coming, we all stand, we all rejoice. He will dwell with them, God, 
and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The blessedness of this hope, if you really understand it, can become overwhelming. I mean, this is it. This is what we're striving for. This moment, this eternal day. And I remember years ago when I was being bombarded by anxious thoughts and depression and mind fog, although it seems that hasn't gone away because I woke up this morning and it wasn't until mid-breakfast I realized it was Sunday. Uh, I literally thought it was Monday and I'm like, all right, so we're going to Costco, going to get some groceries, going to do some work on this or that. And then Jack was like, when's church starting? I'm like, church? We did that yesterday. I'm like, wait a minute. No, it's actually Sunday. Uh, so maybe the brain fog hasn't gone away. But in those moments years ago when I was wrestling with this question of suffering, I had the thought, how can the intense suffering of, of humans be redeemed? How can all this pain that we suffer and that others suffer be reconciled with this thought of a good God? And it was this passage that I clung to with like an iron grip. I held on to this passage and would not let go of it. I couldn't. Look what it says. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. No, no mourning, no crying, no, no pain. For the former things have passed away. That is the key phrase the, at the end there. Passed away. When God wipes your tears, when he casts pain and death and sickness and suffering into the abyss of forgetfulness, it will be all gone. It, it will pass away. God, God has put that to death. God has put suffering, pain, sickness, mourning, you name it. He's put it to death. He's executed it. Now, do you understand what that means? Passed away. It means it's gone. It's gone, never to return, erased, passed away, in the recycle bin, right click, empty bin, it's gone. I used to think it will be as if it never happened. But now I understand it's better to say it will be replaced, erased and replaced with the new. Behold, he says, I'm making all things new. The newness of life given to us by God will be abundant and free and glorious. It says the thirsty will come and drink as much as they wish from the water of life. And what a day that will be. What a day. Again, Isaiah prophesies in Isaiah 25. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We live in a very material culture. And what I mean by that is a lot of people in our country um, only believe in the natural but if you're if you're a Christian and if even if you're not a Christian listen just listen carefully Jesus gives eternal life this is not a metaphor this is never ending life it is real why because Jesus did not metaphorically rise from the grave he really bodily rose. It says the one who conquers will have this heritage. What heritage? God will be his God and he will be God's son. This is the vision. This is the goal. This is what Jesus has done for us. That the whole earth would be completely enveloped in the reign of God and of his Christ. Because where Jesus reigns, there's life and there is blessing. And this is what our secular culture cannot comprehend. Let me, you know, I was talking to somebody yesterday, I was on a podcast yesterday, and he says, um, we're talking about all kinds of stuff, but <laughs> just say this, people can't comprehend that there's a better way than their own. 
People think freedom is doing whatever I want. That's freedom. But that's not freedom. Real freedom is submitting to the truth. That's literally freedom. You cannot have freedom without submission. I know that's hard for our culture to, to, to understand because we think freedom is do as, do as thou wilt, right? We're, functionally, we're a Satanist uh, uh, people because we believe in the, in the core doctrine of Satan, do whatever you want. But real freedom is submitting to that which is true, submitting to that which is real. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what is freedom? I will, he says, you will know, what does Jesus say? You will know the truth and the truth will do what? Set you free. Right? It's right there. Freedom is submission to truth. Freedom is knowing truth and submitting yourself to it. Then you're free. Then you're free. That's freedom. And that's what Jesus brings in his kingdom reign is freedom. This is what everyone in the world's trying to accomplish, except without Christ. And obviously it's not working. It's not working, right? Um, who's that guy from Ukraine? Zelensky came to Canada yesterday, a couple days ago, whatever. And, and everybody's clapping and Trudeau. And all I could see there is just a an attempt to create freedom in the world without Christ. The solution is never Christ. The solution is always more money, more weapons, more bombs. Fight, 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 fight. It's never Christ. The world, they want to, people in the world, the leaders, they want to eradicate pain and mourning and sickness and yes, even death. There's people out here who think through technology we can become hybrid human cyborgs and live forever look i'm not making that up okay that might sound pretty sci-fi it is pretty sci-fi but this stuff is that they're actually trying there's technology now where they're trying to get you to live forever by downloading your brain into a computer chip and and running running your software forever but it's not going to work because without christ there's only misery and if you become a never-dying human cyborg, you have quite literally invented your own eternal punishment. You have invented your own hell. <laughs> You've entered pre-hell, if you will, and the misery of your godless existence will lead you to unplug yourself and face the God you hate eventually. Eventually, you're going to just say, you know what, my existence is too miserable, I'm going to just go ahead and unplug, and you're going to meet the Lord, one way or another. Enough of this madness. It's time we forsake this crazy sci-fi secular religion and come to Christ and have eternal familial life with our God who is our heritage. But the rest, it says the cowards who complied with the beast, the faithless who, who hated God, the detestable, the abortionists, murderers, all who worship false gods, it says their place is in the lake of fire where they will be thrown alive into which is the second death verse 9 let's continue on in revelation 21 how far am i reading here okay then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying come i will show you the bride the wife of the lamb and he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god Having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel who were inscribed. On the east gate three, on the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its walls, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. Boy, what does that mean? 
The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh, I don't know what that is, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrys... Anybody help me with this word here? Uh, Chrysophras. <laughs> the eleventh... Jackin, the twelfth amethyst. In the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl in the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. One more verse here. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. I need to get read up on my precious stones. One of the seven angels who had the bowls of God's wrath spoke to John here, and he advises John to follow him. He says, come and see the bride. Let me show you the bride of the lamb, the wife of the lamb. Then John, it says, was carried away in the spirit to a great high mountain. Now, remember, like this reminds me of when Jesus, when the devil took Jesus to a great high mountain. Remember, and he says, I'll give you all these, these kingdoms if you'll worship me. Now, John is being taken away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And instead of seeing all the kingdoms of the world, what he sees is... The holy city, the new Jerusalem. And uh, what a strange series of events. The angel tells John he's going to be shown the bride, the wife of the lamb. But what he ends up seeing when he's transported is not a wife, a, a woman. What he sees is a city. Why? Be it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious. The city is the bride. The city is symbolic metaphor of the bride of Christ. Us, the church. You are Jerusalem. We are Jerusalem. The city was coming down out of heaven. We will come down out of heaven. Adorned with the glory of God radiating out of it. It was glimmering with these precious stones that surround God's heavenly temple throne room. The jasper and so on and so forth. The city it had a great high wall. Twelve gates with twelve names of the tribes of Israel. The great wall had twelve foundations with the names of the apostles of the Lamb. So it's obvious what the, the symbolism is happening here. The new Jerusalem is the totality of all God's people from all time. We have the tribes of Israel. We have the apostles of the Lamb. Anybody who ever worshipped the true and living God is the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is God's people. We are Jerusalem, the glorious city of God, the bride of Christ. So the angel then begins to measure the city, and the numbers are symbolically significant. 12,000 stadia is reminiscent of the 12,000 sealed ones. Remember back in, I forget the chapter, uh, with the 12,000 um, each from the 12,000 from each each tribe of Israel. The 144 cubits of the wall is reminiscent of the 144,000, the complete number of God's people. So I think it's pretty clear what John's communicating with these numbers and these measurements is as the angel's measuring the, the, the city, what he's doing is uh, uh, discovering numbers that line up with previous numbers in the book of Revelation that also describe the people of God. 12,000 times 12 equals 144,000. 144 cubits of the wall the jewels the foundations are adorned with are those found in the actual breastplate of the priest and again connecting the unity of God's people throughout all time the high priest was the only one permitted to enter the holy of holies during the day of atonement but now the entire city of God is the high priest why because now God is actually present in the city you see the connection? The high priest was the only one able to go into God's presence on the Day of Atonement. Now all God's people are adorned with the jewels of the high priest's breastplate because God is dwelling with them forever now. We are permitted. We are his temple. The Garden of Eden presence of God has been restored and God is now presiding with his people just like he did with Adam. The tabernacle and the temple, this was a temporary thing. But when Jesus came, he was the temple. 
And because of his death and resurrection, now we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever considered that? Have you ever thought about what that means? That your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God actually resides in you now. It's intense. God's people, represented by this imagery of a bride in a, in a city, has become the dwelling place of God forever. This theme is further picked up in verse 23. I'm going to read from verse 23 into chapter 22, down to verse 5. <clears throat> in the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light or of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The city has, we're told, no need for sun or moon, because the glory of God gives it light. There's no night there. This all goes back to Genesis 2. This is the final fulfillment of the Sabbath day. In Genesis 1, the days of creation all follow a pattern. Days 1 through 6 all end with this phrase. There was evening and there was morning. Except day seven. Day seven breaks that pattern. It doesn't say there's any evening or morning. You ever notice that? Look at chapter two of Genesis real quick. That's how it starts. Thus the heavens and earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And that's it. It ends. Day seven does not have an evening or a morning. Why? Why does it break the pattern? Because day seven is prophetic. Day seven is a prophetic promise of an eternal day. The rest of God, the Sabbath, the new Jerusalem, the bride of Christ is described as day seven. How? Because it says of the bride of the city, there is no night there. What does that imply? Well, if it's not evening and it's not morning, when is it? It's day. And it's always day, which means there is no night. There is no evening. There is no morning. It's an eternal day. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, what does that mean? It means all the wealth of all the world will be in that place. It's a metaphorical language assuring God's people that the wealth and the glory of the nations will we will inherit. It will be ours. All of it. And more. This is the promise of Christ that the meek shall inherit the earth. So don't worry if you're poor now. Because you will be eternally rich one day. You already are if you're in Christ. But you will inherit these, this physical wealth too one day. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. That's literally true. The language of Eden continues as we go into chapter 22. The river of the water of life is flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. And on either side of the river is the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit. I've never seen a tree like that bearing 12 different kinds of fruit before. I know you can, you can, uh, what's it called when you merge two fruit? You can graft, I've seen that, a couple different fruits coming from the same vine, but 12 is a little outrageous, I've never seen. Maybe you can do that, perhaps. But what does this mean? What's the 12, 12 kinds of fruits? 
So the 12 is another allusion to the tribes of Israel and the apostles of the Lamb. The leaves are for the healing of the nation. What is the fruit of the tree? The fruit of the tree is the fruit of the gospel. It's the fruit of God's word going out and saving sinners. This is the fruit coming from the tree, the 12 different kinds of fruits. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. Well, what else heals the nations but the gospel? Jesus says, go out into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, making disciples, and so forth. We know the passage. That is the healing of the nations. Going into them, preaching the gospel. God accomplishes this, and he heals the nations. And this is the fruit of the tree of life. So we're all longing for this day when there will be no accursed thing. And isn't this what we think the world is like when we're a child? Uh, I had a decent childhood. I can't speak for everyone what your childhood was like. But if you grew up in a home where your parents shielded you from the harsh, harsh reality of the fallen world to a degree, you lived a pretty good childhood. As a kid, you think everything's great. You have a house. You have a bed. You have food. You have water. It all just kind of shows up when you need it, right? You wake up. There's food. You need. Uh, you poop your pants. Someone comes and changes you, gives you a clean pair. It's just there when you need it. Nothing is accursed in your life. But slowly and sh but surely, the reality of sin in the fallen, broken world emerges. You scrape your knee. You see something bad. Another kid pushes you in, in the park. You get teased. Cops show up and traumatize you by kicking you out of the park for having church. You know, normal stuff. Normal childhood stuff. And then you realize, man, the world's a dangerous place. It's not, it's not how I thought. It's, 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 it's dangerous. And from that day on, you clamor and strive to try to get back to that childlike innocence. To a place where there is no accursed thing. But you can't do it. The more you try, the deeper into brokenness you descend. And then you have some kids of your own, and you see that again. You see them, they're young, and they're innocent, and, and there's no accursed thing in their mind. Then stuff happens. And you see them go through the same process and start to realize it's a dangerous place. And your heart breaks because you want even more to get to that non-accursed place, not just for your sake anymore, but now for their sake. Until this message of the blessed gospel hits your ears and your heart and you're confronted with the reality, Jesus is alive. That the tomb is empty, that he is coming again to usher in this non-accursed existence. Void of curses, a place wherein the throne of God will reside and his servants will worship him forever and forever and forever. A place where we'll, we'll finally see his face and his name will be on our foreheads signifying we are his and we are safe finally a place with no night with no darkness no need of sun no need of moon because our god will be our light and we will reign forever and ever and this is the picture of eternal life of the blessed hope of the gospel <clears throat> heaven as many call it is a renewed day seven eden city all these images and themes are all mashed together to try to describe for us something so glorious that words cannot do justice to it. A new heaven, a new earth, a creation void of all evil and accursed things. The new Jerusalem, the holy city where God will dwell forever and ever and ever. And people will say to me often, Alan, if God is so good, why doesn't he just remove all evil? <clears throat> Excuse me. Sir, have you read Revelation 21? <laughs> That's literally what he does. You're just upset that he doesn't do it quicker. That's the issue. The issue is not why doesn't God remove evil. It's why doesn't he do it on my timeline? That's the issue. And oftentimes when I'm talking to people who ask this question, I say, listen, my friend. If God were to remove all that which is a curse and all that which is evil... Would he not have to remove you? Are you right with God? Are you righteous? Or are you not a sinner? Well, what you're asking of God is to destroy you. That's not good. <laughs> you don't want to be in that position. Instead, you ought to get right with God, be faithful, and wait for him to do the job himself. 
He will wipe away our tears. All that is associated with this order of things. As some say, the New World Order. Which is not really new at all. It's kind of an ancient serpent world order. All that's associated with this beast will pass away. Death will die. Sickness will become terminal. Pain will be a distant me memory, almost like a dream we've forgotten. Pain, oh, remember that? No, not really. It's been 10 billion years since that, and we got another infinity ahead of us. Mourning will be impossible. Mourning as in sadness, but also mourning as in waking up, because there's no, uh, there's no night there. <laughs> so both those things, I don't know, I'm not a mourning person, so for me it's, it's good news that that mourning will end, because... I won't have to wake up and be groggy and miserable. I can just be forever joyful in the day. There will be abundance of life with our king. We will be made perfect and all unclean and detestable things will be forbidden from entry. This day is coming, but until it does, we must continue to strive forward, working for a better day now keeping our eyes on Christ and our hands to the plow as the reward that he purchased for us awaits our redemption. Never lose sight of that because that's the only thing that's going to get us through this crazy life. I can't imagine going through life without this hope. Man, oh man. How? How? How do you do it? I don't know. I couldn't do it. And some will say, oh, that's because you're weak. I don't know, man. Try being a Christian for a couple months and see. <laughs> uh, I'm not a Christian because it makes my life easier. Believe me, I could do a lot of different things to make my life easier and forsake the truth. It would make my life easier. But it would not be worth it. The, um, what's it called? The, um cost analysis between being a Christian and not being a Christian it's more beneficial cost analysis to be a Christian because maybe life will be harder for you maybe you will face persecution and hardship no not maybe you will <laughs> let's face it but the reward is greater the reward is greater because Christ is our reward and Paul says I count everything as dung in comparison to knowing Jesus Christ my Lord. The Apostle Paul literally said, everything outside of knowing Jesus is dung. You know what dung is, right? No? I'll tell you. It's poop. It's, it's cow manure. So never lose sight of Christ as your reward. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this morning together that we, we might go into your word and see a vision of something that John could only describe by pulling images from the scriptures. And I'm sure what his eyes actually beheld were infinitely more glorious than any words can describe. But your word is supernatural. So I pray you give us some sort of... Um, spiritual insight vision into the meaning of this text so that we could keep our eyes on you keep our eyes on the prize not waver left or right but to continue forward on the narrow path um, of eternal life so help us to be strong in worship in um, devotion to you and in love for you and our neighbors we thank you all, and we pray all this in jesus name amen amen